Okay, so a look at the only writing in the Great Pyramid, except if you count the Alpha and the Omegas. I found one in a secret part of the Great Pyramid, and my friend Robert Grant found one in a very public part of the Great Pyramid. But other than those Alpha and Omegas, the only writing in the Great Pyramid is the Tetragrammaton, the four letters, and they appear right underneath the chevrons in that spot right there. Okay, here's the original entrance where they are. Here I am with some Texas adventurers standing in that, that entrance. Okay, so you can see by the arrow where those four letters are. They're down below the chevrons. So Alan Green and I did a video up there, which I hope to be showing you pretty soon. All right, so let's look at those four letters now. So the pr pronunciation-wise, the V is a D. It's pronounced D. And then uh, this letter right here is pronounced B. And this one was pronounced R, according to Dr. Robert Schock. So that's Dubar. That's how it's pronounced. It happens to be my family name. My grandfather is a James F. Dubar. My grandmother, I'll never forget the story she told me about how, you know, Larry, your grandfather, when he says something, he means it. His word means something. He's not like other men. And that's what's at the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid is a word. It stands strong. The biggest building on earth for 4,000 years. It's t still giving messages. It's a word, okay? That's the bar, okay? But that's how it's pronounced. What about the symbols? Okay. Well, uh, this one right here. Well, it sort of looks like a, the water symbol. So I took that to mean the flood. And then before the flood, the earth had uh, 12 months or 30 days each, and there was no uh, tilt in the axis. But after the devastating effects of the flood, we have the 23.5 degree tilt of the earth that we see even today. Okay, but that's uh, a, a pole shift from the past. I think the Great Pyramid prophesies one for the future. I've done a program about that. More to come on another time. Okay. Let's look at, at it now, though, again. Here's the four letters, okay, that their entrance at the Great Pyramid. Let's look at this one. Okay, so when you have cross-hatching over an area, that means area. That's usually what that symbol means. So we've got area. Okay, what about this symbol right here? Well, it looks like a, a radius through a circle. Now, we use pi today to talk about that, but maybe in the past, you know, they used a symbol like that. They didn't have pi, so they used that, circle and radius. That would be the pi symbol, okay? Right there. All right, what about this symbol right here? All right, well, you know, there are two circles that follow it, okay? So circles have radiuses, all right? Okay, so there's the two circles. So that V could be just two radii of a circle. And so, you know, you could say one's R, there's a radius. That's R, that's a radius. Or you could say R squared, okay? So that's what the, the V could be, all right? Now this, you know, it kind of looks like an equal symbol, doesn't it? I mean, it could be in some kind of ancient equal symbol. And so you have radius squared times pi equals the area. Incredible. One of the pi formulas that's known by most school children is at the entrance of the Great Pyramid, possibly, okay? But then let's, let's think about pi here, all right? So we know, uh, as we've already said, that that symbol that I'm putting the lines through here now, that that could symbolize area. The cross hatching symbolizes area. Okay, but think about this. Okay, could it mean something else? Could it mean circumference? Okay, so let's think about that. You know, it could be it could be saying circumference because there's a like a double meaning there. Okay, because diameter times pi equals circumference. That's the formula. Okay, we know that that V is pronounced D. So there's your D. And then this symbol that we were just looking at, oh, there's like two lines, like a Roman numeral two, like two. Maybe it has two meanings. It's not just area. It also could be circumference. Okay, so now what about this one? Well, it sort of looks like the is about equal to, doesn't it? Okay, so diameter times pi is about equal to, except they wouldn't have put about equal to because diameter times pi does equal the circumference exactly. But the fact that they put is about equal to well, anciently, 22 sevenths was used as a way to approach a practical usage of pi. Buildings all over the place are, are 22 sevenths is used in their building. So really, it's diameter times a practical value for pi is about equal to the circumference. That's an incredibly advanced formula in a sense, you know, if that's what it's saying. The diameter times a practical value for pi approximately, very closely, about equals the circumference. Okay. So what we're, we've shown here is the two formulas for pi 
are at, at, at those four letters at the entrance of the Great Pyramid. The area formula, pi, how to find the area of a circle by pi, and how to find the circumference. Those are two different pi formulas, and I'm suggesting they're both suggested by the four letters of the tetragrammaton. All right. <laughs> so, could it be, you know, am I, am I stretching these four letters? Could it be prophetically they were known, e even if they weren't intended? The way I just showed made sense, didn't it? Everything I said was rational. I followed the symbols. So wasn't it, could it be that they prophetically, that those four letters prophetically held those two pi formulas, the formula for area and, and uh, for circumference. After all, those four letters are the word, the logos, they're the source of knowledge. Okay, so recently I published this video about the Euler identity formula being on the plateau of Giza. Incredible. This most beautiful formula, this is a, a look into that video. So, you know, go watch that video because see what I say there? I say it's going to blow your mind, okay? Because so, it's an incredible thing that I'm saying that Euler's identity formula, this beautiful math formula, was on Giza. So I asked Robert Grant, my friend, about it. Could it be, what do you think? Watch my video. Do you think I've made a case that Euler's identity formula could be on Giza? You know, it's a radical claim, but I really think it was there. So I wanted to see what Robert said. So Robert wrote back and he said, well, the Euler relationship we've known about for a long time, so you could be right about that. He says, but another thing that adds credence to your thesis, my thesis that, you know, th this formula is on the Giza Plateau, is the name Sphinx actually means image. Or, and he gets that from a translation of the Emerald Tablets, because that's the I, the imaginary number in that formula. Then he says, that said, it seems so outlandish, my claim, that there must be some truth to it, but not likely, in my opinion, a result of deliberate conscious decision, but rather by the invisible hand of providence. So Robert's saying, no, I don't think they intended it, but I think that you found it there shows the invisible hand of providence put it. So there's those, log those logos, those four letters, okay? The invisible hand of providence. So I'm just suggesting the same thing is true for these two pi formulas. Incredible. All right. Well, thanks for watching.